Well, The Intercept says Apple's new messages app might hide your conversations from prying eyes, but the names of the people that you contact could be accessible to Apple, and they could hand that over to authorities in some situations. Joining us to talk about what this means is Ian Thompson, reporter at The Register. Welcome, Ian. Hi, thanks, Megan. Always a pleasure. So what are your thoughts on this report? Uh, I don't really see why people are getting their knickers in a twist about it, to be honest. I mean, Apple has never denied that it took metadata from uh, from its products. It only keeps the logs for 30 days. I think the only people who are going to be seriously concerned about this are the iSheep who buy the buy Apple's devices on the version on the on the assumption that they will keep absolutely everything that they do secret forever and ever. Amen. Um, I mean, obviously, the document the Intercept got hold of uh, is quite interesting in seeing how police services intend to use this this information. Um, but I'm certain, as far as I'm aware, Apple has never actually denied that it was willing to hand over metadata when it came to legally produced uh, warrants for it. So, I mean, if obviously if you're an Apple fanboy or girl and, and you thought that everything was, was totally cushy and, you know, there was never going to be any information passed to the police, then uh, you're going to be disappointed by this. But if people honestly thought that, then they were fooling themselves. Well, I, I guess the information itself isn't, it's it's who you might have contacted. So it's the name, if, and not even necessarily contacted. It's people that you said, you know, maybe I wanted to see if Jason was, you know, had gotten himself an iPhone, he had, was on messages. And so I would try to put his number in there. That would be the only information. So it seems like so little information that you could, I guess you could draw conclusions from it. Um, but it seems like you could more often you know, draw false conclusions from this information. It doesn't seem like, well, maybe I just put someone's number. Is that like something that someone could use against me in court? Oh, yes. I mean, in fact, when you look at it, uh, I, I was having a chat with one of the guys that uh, used to work for the CIA and is now in private industry. And he was saying, if you're actually looking to track people and work out the networks and connections that they have, then metadata is far more useful than the actual contents of the messages themselves because it builds up an image of who exactly you're contacting them, when you contact them, what IP address they're on. All this is data which Apple stores. Um, and then you can build up a network of connections. And it, it's almost like a sort of mini social network. You can see who's talking to who and how frequently. It gives you a very good method of tracking the, the individuals in, in question. We've already seen this in action before with the case of uh, General David Petraeus, who, is, if you remember, got censured for uh, handing out uh, confidential army, army documents to his mistress. Now, the reason they caught on to that was because they were able to backtrace the IP messages, uh, the IP addresses of the uh, messages that he was sending rather than actually reading the messages themselves, identify her as a prime suspect and then work, work around from then. So if you're severely worried about, anyway, if you're worried about sort of the government tracking you and the rest of it, then, you know, metadata is far more useful than the content of messages. Uh, because A, it allows these networks, and B, you don't have to go through the tedious process of reading through endless emails of, hi, the cat's been fed and medicated, see you soon, blah, blah, blah. You know, awful lot of data that generally has to be read by humans. Whereas with metadata systems, you can feed this into a fairly smart bit of software and instantly get an entire network of who and who the target is communicating with, how often, and sort of where they're doing it from. Yeah, a lot of this stuff that's, you know, searchable, trackable online, you know, and a lot of the revelations around the Edward Snowden, you know, kind of aspect of all these things. I think what's what's interesting about this to me is that it's more it's more a signal of intention than it is a signal of of like action, right? Like you you might think that by opening up your phone and punching in three numbers or whatever, all you're doing is punching in three numbers, then you delete it and you move on. Like that might be your your initial thought. But in this case, what is happening here is that when you're doing that, if, if I understand this correctly, that is actually sending a signal to Apple to then find how that m matches up, pairs up with contacts you may or may not have and, you know, pulls back information. In doing so, there is a log created around that. So it's not it's not the the typical example of, oh, well, you obviously were in contact with this particular person on that date. It's I had an inkling to look up this particular person and by in doing so in just like laying that in there and never hitting enter, never actually executing anything whatsoever, you've sent, I don't know, a signal, a clue, whatever you want to call it, uh, that can be picked up on after the fact. And that seems like another level to me. Yeah, that's a very interesting point, Jason. I mean, it is one of those things where they've, um, you know, people don't quite you know, we all love the, the the convenience of having a mobile phone, the, you know, the, the ease of use and the rest of it. But very little thinking goes into what goes on behind the scenes. 
I think in this case, it was quite encouraging that Apple only keeps this data for 30 days. Um, but I can certainly see the police gearing up to use it. They're getting increasingly savvy about using mobile phones in this way. I mean, it t it's taken them long enough to get you know, get their act together on this, and they tended to overreach in the case of certain government agencies. Um, but I think local police are, are now sort of, they, they, they're aware of this. They want to use these tools. And as long as privacy is respected, then I can see very little reason for them not to. Um, it's just a question of making sure that we have the rules firmly in place to see that this isn't abused um, and to see that it, it's carried out in a, in, a, in, a, in a responsible manner. But I don't think there's any telephone uh, maker or telco out there who wouldn't be prepared to work with a lawful uh, request for information in this matter. And it's going to be increasingly important in cases going forward. So you said no one would really be upset about this except the eye sheep. I resemble that <laughs> remark. Thank you. <laughs> oh, come on. You know, it's like you, you don't believe blindly in Apple, Megan. It's no, just that there are a number of people out there who really do. And yeah. it, it's it's both sad and deeply, deeply amusing. Right. I, need, I just needed you to say that, not me. It, it's better when it comes from you. <laughs> but... I guess what's, I'm the one going to be getting the death threats. Right then, now, right. exactly. <laughs> so, I, I mean, what Sam Biddle was basically saying is what we need Apple and other companies to do is not just come out with those statements. Like, I mean, Apple sent, spent the better part of the first few months of this year, you know, saying, like, we use end, end encryption. We are for your privacy. We would not turn this information over. But, like, when you really get down to the technical aspects of it, there are parts of it that they are turning over. I mean, they made a statement to The Intercept. They said, you know, they didn't, I guess they didn't deny it. It, but they, you know, they said, yes, we, that is accurate, that document that mm. you have. So, I mean, I, I guess, yeah, do you agree that companies need to be more specific about the technical things and not just these lofty, we believe in your privacy statements? Oh, no, I agree with that totally. I just think Satan will go to work on a snowplow before it actually happens. Um, I mean, Apple has been hoist by its own marketing petard in this. I mean, they, they did a very, very good fight against the FBI in the San Bernardino case and a huge props to Tim Cook for not bowing to government pressure. But I think there's, there's no real incentive for companies to tell their customers exactly what information is being collected on them and what it's going to be used for. It's, there's nothing but downside for the companies in doing this. Um, and whereas if they keep quiet about it and just confirm it when somebody actually raises these awkward points, it's from a PR and marketing standpoint, it's a much better way of damage control. Now, I agree with you totally, and I've had arguments with Leo about this, but companies should be a lot more upfront about what data they're collecting and how it can be used. But there's no real incentive for them to do it other than, other than by customer pressure. And the vast majority of customers either don't know or don't care. I mean, it's part of our job as journalists to actually keep people informed on this. But, um, you know, with however many millions of devices out there, you know, your average Joe or Jane on the street isn't going to care that much until it affects them personally or until they read a headline which scares them silly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well, Ian, thank you so much for explaining what this means to us. Uh, Ian Thompson is a reporter at The Register. He's at Ian Thompson on Twitter. Thanks so much for coming on. Pleasure as always. I'll see you soon. Take see care. See you soon, Ian.